and welcome once again to Senior Focus. I'm your host, Bill Adams, and Senior Focus comes to you a couple times each month through Armstrong's Channel 20, and thanks to Greg Roden and Armstrong Cable for the opportunity to meet with you, and also thanks to Keith Kaiser and all the folks at the Mill Creek Metro Park System. We come to you from the Davis Visitor Center here at uh, Mill Creek Metro Parks and certainly encourage you to come out and enjoy the park. A lot of things to do here. And today we have, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, way back when, <laughs> way back, <laughs> I won't say how long, uh, but we have Dorothy Bartow from the um, Alzheimer's Assistance and Referral Network. But Dorothy, I think you were the first guest I ever had at the original Senior Focus many years ago. Could have been because <laughs> Alzheimer's starts with A. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maybe, but it wasn't alphabetical. I think uh, we did it because you were the best guest we could possibly well, come up with. Thank so. you. Thank you. Uh, why don't you talk about a little bit about what you do with the uh, Alzheimer's Assistance and Referral Network, you know, where it's located and contact information. And, and again, we'll repeat that through the show too. Sure. Uh, well, the Alzheimer Network, which is a shortened version of the whole name, mm -hmm. the Alzheimer Network is actually uh, in the Valley. We're based here. We're an all-volunteer organization, and we are here to help people. Uh, we're not out of town. We are here. We know the services here. We know the people here. Uh, we know the quality of the uh, services in the Valley and can help people. We can answer questions. We have an information line. And that's, uh, we'll repeat it, but it's 330-788-9755. And we answer questions, anything from someone who is wondering about early symptoms to uh, where do I find an adult daycare? What is an adult daycare? Uh, if people haven't been involved with something like this, they don't really know where to start. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may, may be some unusual behavior that somebody has. It may be someone that says, I have to get to a support group where's the next one? Or I live in Girard, where's, where do I go? Right. Wh whatever. And uh, we have educational seminars too. Uh, in the spring, a uh, little bit later after the weather clears, we'll have a three session caregiver series. And that's designed to explain symptoms, diagnosis, the behaviors. Uh, we get into a little about um, the legal and financial issues that people need to understand. Uh, some of the community services, safety issues, learning to cope. It, it takes, like, each session is two hours. And then at the end of the uh, session, we give them the book, The 36-Hour Day, mm -hmm. which is excellent. It's, it's the best book. Uh, it's in its third edition. It's the best book out there. And then we, we have some other special seminars, too. We have a legal and financial seminar just focused on that. We also have... Uh, uh, seminars on research so that people are up to date because there will be something released oh, on TV or in the paper and people get all excited and they think that's the cure or that's the way to get it diagnosed and there still is no absolute diagnosis. There's a couple of tantalizing clues mm -hmm. but just that announcement on the air doesn't mean it's available to everybody. Right. So we, we caution folks about that. We have a couple fundraisers we do during the year. Our next one will be Valley Memories, and that's going to be March the 16th. It will be out at Avion on the water. And then we have some other things like a walk at the Canfield Fairgrounds and a garage sale because it takes a little bit of dollars to pay the phone bill and a few other things. Well, that's a good point, though. Again, this is a volunteer group, though, correct? Absolutely. So all the money that you would raise goes into all the materials you pass out and, and uh, holding uh, the support groups and all, and all these different uh, activities mm -hmm. that you uh, and services you provide obviously cost money. So And you, we do it all for free for families. We don't charge. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. well, that's tremendous. So you're, you're just relying basically on the uh, kindness of the you know, uh, community. And, and I know just from looking at your newsletter, uh, you do get um, donations from families you know, who have come to you and, you know, maybe in memory of their loved one and they say, you know, we really appreciate the work you did. Yes, we do. You know. Yeah. Well, speaking of, uh, you, you talked, uh, it, it, you know, part of the caregiver series is maybe the symptoms of Alzheimer's and a little bit of information about it. Why don't we explain, or you, you can explain, I guess, a little bit about um, what Alzheimer's is and what people should look for 
if they're, you know, if they see uh, some signs in a, in a family member, what, what are they looking for? Well, uh, it, it's such a, a it's such a subtle thing the way it starts out. Mm -hmm. You can't just pinpoint like you would with a, a broken leg. Well, they broke their leg, you can see it's broken, they can test that it's broken, they can cast it, they can do whatever they have to do. But with Alzheimer's, it sneaks up on people. There will be just little changes along the way. One day they may be quite, pretty good, another day they may not, not be so good. It's, it is problems with recent memory that most people notice. And the thing is about that, they can remember things that happened in the past and be accurate. They know those things and they know them well. And so people will excuse a little bit about, oh, well, he forgot the doctor's appointment mm -hmm. or he forgot what, to take his medicine. Well, and that might be a little bit of a clue that something's going wrong. Someone can have Alzheimer's uh, or the early stages, I'll say, the beginnings of it for three years and be able to cover it up. And, and, and maybe work and do yes. everything. Yeah. Hmm. And other people may step in a little bit or, or they might say, someone might say, well, you know, he has arthritis. It, probably a little hard for him to write anymore when maybe he didn't know what to write. Mm -hmm. uh, th there are uh, situations where people will ask the same question over again, and again, that reflects on recent memory. If you ask me something and in a little bit you ask it again, when I've answered it, it means your recent memory didn't remember it, or you're doing, what do they, they call that, you know, you're forgetting it by choice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like take the garbage out. Oh, I forgot to do that, didn't I? <laughs> so that's not necessarily all time. Right. Well, that's a good point that there are some things too, I would think like medications and illness, other illnesses that could resemble uh, Alzheimer's or people think maybe uh, they're worried about that, but actually uh, it's something else. So I, I guess you have to go to a doctor maybe the first step to Absolutely. Yeah. We have a, a handout that we use, and I encourage people over the phone, even if I just have to dictate some of the questions to them, you've got to let the doctor know that something's going on, because in most cases, the patient isn't going to tell the doctor, well, I was driving to the grocery store and I got lost going home. They're not going to tell that. And the, the brighter and more intelligent a person is, the better off they are covering it up. So they can uh, slip a little bit and uh, people start noticing it. And if you don't report it to the doctor, and I would tell people every time this comes up, don't just blurt something out in front of the person at the doctor's office. Write the doctor a letter, use that form letting the doctor know that we have, and mail that to him because Doctors know well enough that they can do a, a very simple little test in the office to clue them in as to how that recent memory is functioning. And that's one of the biggest clues. That and someone who used to be able to balance their checkbook and can't do it now. Mathematics seems to be something that they have trouble with early on. Mm -hmm. uh, but some people also are able to do it, but it's, it's a clue. The person that could do it and can't do it now, something's changed. Mm -hmm. Now, I know uh, because I've seen you uh, present seminars and, and things to professionals and, and to families, um, you've worked uh, quite closely with uh, Dr. Wilkins over at St. E's. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, somebody like uh, a gerant, uh, is he a geriatric uh, he, specialist? He specializes in geriatrics, yes. So they would be the people maybe to, to go see to you know, uh, do some of the testing and, and some of the checks to... Uh, and it doesn't hurt to start with a family doctor because the family doctor probably knows that person uh, better than a, a doctor that sure. is new on the case. But that doesn't mean that the family doctor can't ask for a uh, second opinion from a specialist. There are good clinics in Cleveland and Pittsburgh that are research centers. But not everybody wants to go that far. Mm -hmm. I wish we had more geriatric doctors uh, because we have an, a very large population of elderly people. And let's face it, it is mostly older people who get Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that younger people can't, but it's much more rare. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Is uh, I, I have known personally people, um, even in their 50s, that were 
diagnosed and um, but this is generally what uh, say 85 plus or maybe 80 plus is the is sort of when the 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 graph if you looked at an age of, of when people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's I think as you get older the po the possibilities go up it increases uh, the general mathematical scale is between 60 Five and 75, it's 10 percent, and then 75 to 85, it, uh, that would be 10 percent of the population, mm -hmm. and then between 65 and 75, be like 25 percent, and if they're 85 plus, it's about half, so 50 yeah. percent. So if you and I both live to 85, one of us may have Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And and I uh, that would point to, and, and again, I guess there's no uh, current. Uh, Diagnosis for for how it develops, right? I mean, as to, I mean, and you could talk about that, but I guess that would point to some somehow it's uh, it's related to the age of the brain or something's going on in the brain that uh, something you know. does change in the brain. They know that something changes. Uh, there's a problem with a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. There's not enough of it. There's a problem with an amyloid that builds up on the brain cells. They know that. But why do those two things start? Why is there diminished acetylcholine? Why is there this buildup of protein? And there's something else called TAW, which is uh, part of the brain processes. And why does that not work right? Mm -hmm. Something initially starts out. And some of researchers are actually saying the disease probably starts 20 years before we see symptoms. OK. And one of the programs that's been in place at the uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center at their Alzheimer's Center is to test what they call MCI, mild cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. and watch two groups of people, uh, each of them with mild cognitive impairment, but one group may show more t of a tendency to have that progress into Alzheimer's. Everybody forgets some things as they get older. That's sure. mild cognitive impairment. But it's the folks that increase and increase in their difficulty of uh, daily tasks. That's where the Alzheimer's comes in. Well, why are the two different? We don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, say someone then uh, has gone to their family doctor and, and maybe through that process or to a referral to a, a specialist, they have the diagnosis now. They're, they're diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's. What are some of the treatments that are available to those folks? Um, maybe starting with uh, uh, you know the beginning stages, and does does that change? I guess as as people get more uh, into the disease, there are three medications in a family called cholinesterase inhibitors, and those three would be likely what the doctor would choose from initially, because they help with that uh, neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. They help in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, the brand names are Aricept, Exelon, and Razadine. Um, later on, uh, what is indicated for moderate Alzheimer's is an addition of a drug called Namenda, okay. and that works on that amyloid protein. None of them cure the disease. None of them stop it. That's the sad part is it can slow it down, but there's no way to stop it because initially we don't know what went wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's where we need to really focus our attention in, in research is what happens. Well, you mentioned that both Cleveland and Pittsburgh have research going on, um, institutions there. Are there local folks that are part of that uh, that you know of that, you know, maybe have joined a study on a drug or something? There are some doctors that do some individual drug studies, but if someone wants to get into an extended program, those two facilities, Cleveland and Pittsburgh, uh, are the most likely. Case Western Reserve uh, has their clinic. We donate to that from our uh, garage sales and all of our other mm -hmm. events every year, and also to UPMC in Pittsburgh because families here tend to either be more comfortable with Pittsburgh or Cleveland. If they're going to get into research, we want it to be close for them. Mm 